Hi. <laughs> um, yeah, so look, I'm Gary Broadbent. Um, I'm the uh, Interaction Design Capability Lead at the DTA. Um, my talk is in two parts today, so I'll be as quick as I can. And Jack actually touched on some of this already, like selling a design system to management. That's just our learnings, some tips and advice that we found at the DTA about how you go about selling design systems. And then the second part is around driving adoption. I think that's really part of that as well. I think how do you get people to be involved in it and collaborate to, you know, at the moment in, in Australian government, 3,000 practitioners. So it's a lot of people. So the scale for us is quite different to Jack's talk. His very small teams were right at the other end of the scale. Um, so yeah, part one. Um, I guess, you know, first things that management and executives want is like, what is it? And I think, you know, Jack touched on this and I think it's all those things. It's, we mean front end frameworks, principles, brand identity, design guides, code, accessibility, pattern libraries, tone of voice, all of those things are included in design systems. Um, Jack had this quote as well. And I think for us, you know, it, we, it really resonates with us. I think go and check out Nathan Curtis if you haven't already. He's a thought leader in this space. And I think for us at the DTA and with Australian government at the federated level, you know, the ecosystem is really important to us. And I think having the community around that is, is vital in making sure those design systems, you know, actually happen. Um, second point, you know, why do we need one? And, and, you know, Jack's touched on this already. For us, Australian government, we have got 44 million pages of content, and the last count we had 1,100 websites, so it's a lot. Um, do we have a problem? I think we do. This is self-explanatory, you know, they're about consistency, it's about you know, the look and feel of sites, the way they work, the experience, the UX, all those things, we have a problem. I'll leave that one there. Um, and also, you can imagine all of those practitioners across government that there's a unnecessary duplication of effort with teams across government. You know, they're reinventing the wheel every time, they're doing the same things over and over again. And I think that's really important when you start talking to management about those things, so. And then third, who will be using it? And again, most people here would know it's aimed at designers and developers. It's for content writers, product owners, user researchers, and even, you know, outside of government, third parties like yourselves. Um, I guess one thing we did at the DTA as well, we had a, a workshop, and that was really to get the teams aligned on the vision, the mission, and the goals of what a design system is. So I think that's a really good starting point and the basics of how you get there. And really out of this workshop, you start to define these things, but also that feeds into a product pack as well, and that product pack you can take to management and talk through some of your early ideas and what you want to try and do with a design system. And this is our vision at the DTA, is a beautiful, usable, accessible, and accessible government services through shared code and insights. Um, that's supposed to be quite inspiring and insp inspirational, a kind of a vision piece. The mission is more about how you get there. Um, these are some of our goals and you know, some outcomes and benefits that we want from our system. You know, Jack talked about a lot of these things as well. You know, efficiency, we reduce that duplication in government, build faster and better, user-centered and accessible. Accessibility and usability are at the forefront of what we do, and I know Trevor and uh, Alex have got a talk later on about that more, in more detail. Uh, obviously consistency and, and, and consi co cohesive user experience. And engagement and uplift is actually kind of a natural organic outcome of doing design systems where you start building capability within your teams actually about sharing and learning and ways of working. I think that's a really natural outcome of that. Um, is it worth it? And this is where you know, management really start to listen. Design systems save time and money. Billions, in fact. Billions and billions. Um, you know, this is this kind of stuff that's happening at the moment. You know, designers are constantly saying, what's a shade of blue? What colours? Past accessibility. Where do we put this government crest? How should I design this form? Has this pattern been used before? When you kind of break that down into how much time designers across government ask those questions, you know, you can look at return on investment for design systems. So, you know, $50 per hour, 1,000 designers across government is kind of roughly where we're at. Save two and a half hours a week, that's 6.5 million a year if we can stop them asking those questions. And developers, it's the same kind of thing. Can I rebuild this? It doesn't match the design. What's the latest documentation? How can we build this pattern? Um, you know, does this work with the screen reader? Those kind of questions again, and you do the similar you know, approach to that return on investment with design systems, you know, 12.8 million a year. These are just rough numbers, but you can see if we can save a couple of hours a week for designers and developers, you know, the, the benefit is massive. Um, the other things we did as well, uh, we talked about measuring the success of a design system as well, and I think that's really important for your roadmap and your journey about how people are you know, using it. So we've just got some metrics here around like the number of downloads, 
uh, task completion on the design system website, how they're going through the documentation site, number of websites and services using those, that design system and the components, uh, active users in the community, the number of users, feedback, PRs, uh, design contributions, and then measuring how happy they are as well. We can put certain metrics around that as well. Um, so yeah, that's the first part. Uh, second part, part two, and that was really about you know, some advice, some tips, things we've learned about driving adoption, especially in our scenario with, with government and those 3,000 practitioners. And the first thing we did, we ran a workshop at the Australian Tax Office about 18 months ago, and that back then we called them design guides, but we asked this question, you know, what sucks about design guides? And, and we had a whole day workshop and we got some really good insights to some of the problems from the feedback we got. So, yeah, they were talking about for designers, it limits creativity. Um, you know, what's the rationale? What's, it's all about documenting all the things with our components and patterns and templates. You know, the what and the why is really important to across government designers and developers because if they don't know the rationale, they probably won't follow it. Um, always be open and clear and transparent about your intention and the benefits. Uh, my, my great IT issues, and that's really about a lot of departments uh, got closed networks, they're behind firewalls, you know, being open source is kind of a hard thing in government as well, it's not a normal way of working. Um, being consistent and flexible, so there's a consistency there, but there's flexibility where they can customise certain things. Obviously early and often engagement with users is paramount, and um, you know, we get that question asked a lot, you know, why can't we use Bootstrap? And Bootstrap doesn't really fit needs of government, it's not accessible to, our, to the level we need with a AA compliant, it doesn't support a lot of legacy browsers, so there's a lot of reasons why you know, Bootstrap doesn't fit our particular needs. Um, there's another quote from Brad Frost. If you haven't heard of him, check him out. I'm sure most people have. Um, you know, he talks about federated design systems and around collaboration and communication trumps process and deliverables. That really resonated with us, and it kind of validated us a little bit around some of our thinking. And it's not that deliverables aren't important. It's just that to get that to work, collaboration communication is really important. Um, you know, and that's what we start to think about how we might solutionize that. So around communication, support on, and assistance on implementation, I think within government they need to know that they're being supported and we communicate with them regularly, we give them advice and support around how they implement the design system. And also it's about we're serving people and a people-driven approach I think is really key. It's not just about delivering stuff and letting them go wild, it's, it's really talking to them, being involved in that process. You know, managing expectations, Guidelines aren't rules, and those rules, things, you know, that it's, it's around guidance and just giving them advice. Um, everyone is an owner of the design system. I think for us to get that adoption, everybody's involved in the process. Everybody's involved in actually collaborating and, and giving us feedback. Um, that gives them a bit of ownership as well. Um, communication connects people in teams. That was really important about building our community around how we get people on board. And then create trust in that pl platform as well, invite people and invite users to contribute as well. Um, you know, and Nathan Curtis talks about this a lot as well around traditionally it's a centralized kind of uh, model with a design system in the middle and everybody just uses it. But we're talking about this spread federated model with different people in different teams contributing back to the system. So it's a shared um, ownership of that, of that system. Um, you know, another thing we learned, show them, not tell them. You know, include users in the process, um, what work you're doing in progress, share ownership of that. They have control, they feel like they're part of that system because it's not our design system, it's whole of government. Um, you know, we also facilitate that engaged digital co-design community, let them share, share, collaborate on those human-centered design problems. I think that's where we see the real value. Um, being open by default, and I just talked about this briefly before, you know, getting open source approval in government you know, is, is a good thing. And they're not normally familiar with working with open source, but it's absolutely vital around that adoption, because if it's not, it's, nobody will use it. Um, you know, devs are used to working open source. How many devs are here? Most of them work in open source, right? Designers, not so much. And I'm like, why not both? Why can't we get designers to start to collaborate on those human-centered problems that we have in, in government and websites? So, yeah. Some of the biggest barriers and constraints are, again, this workflow, communication, how you contribute to the design system, and that includes those tech limitations and blockers around firewalls and networks and, and things like that. Um, open the process to build trust, value, and scale into the system. You know, the more people that start to use it, the more trust you build within the system, the more value we get because more people are contributing, and it scales as well. So that was you know, a big learning for us. Um, and again, aim for the 
a path of least resistance, encourage engagement and adoption. You know, a design system is only as effective as its adoption. If nobody uses it, it's not, not, you know, it's not worth it. Um, I've got one last thing. I've flown through that. Um, be great, be boring, be consistent, love a design system. Now, Trevor over there, this is one of our values around our design system. And I guess what we mean by this is that design systems kind of are boring. And I mean that they're, they do all the hard work to make the people using it and contributing to it easier. It gives them more time to focus on the real difficult problems around not worrying about you know, the next login form and how I lay out form or what colors I should use. It's already done, that hard work's been done around accessibility and usability and things. And then really designers can focus on those difficult user experience, end-to-end -end service problems and developers can really focus on you know, implementation as well. And I think that's really important. You know, it's less time worrying about <laughs> pixel perfect designs, it's less time worrying about accessible colors, it's less time in meetings, it's less time explaining back and forth with PM and devs and it's more time creating. So I just wanted to leave and finish on that one. Thank you.